Our speaker tonight is Shar Norman, a current member of the Dublin Area Art League. Shar Norman is an accomplished fiber artist specializing in paper making and fiber sculpture. She received a Master of Fine Arts from Claremont Graduate University and a Bachelor's of Arts from Scripps College. Shar has lectured and exhibited extensively both nationally and internationally. She has developed and conducted workshops for all ages, worked as a consultant to area schools and community arts organizations, and served as a trustee for the Greater Columbus Arts Council. She held the position of Associate Provost and Dean of Faculty at the Columbus College of Art and Design, and has now returned to the studio as a full-time professional artist. Currently, she is in a wonderful show at the Columbus Cultural Arts Center with artist Helen Hoffeld. The name of the show is Tipping Point and it goes through March 26th. And the opening reception is tomorrow, February 18th, 6 to 8 p.m. Char, thank you so much to come and speak to us, to our members and the art lovers that are connecting. We're looking forward to hearing all about your work, your inspiration, and uh, as you work as an environmental fiber artist. And, and I hand, if I understand correctly, all of your recent work has been inspired by a wonderful trip to the Amazon rainforest. So I'm really looking forward to hear all about your presentation. Great. Well, thank you for inviting me. Um, this is just really fun. I hopefully you can hear me. I'm not muted. I'm going to try to share my screen. Um, all right, that seemed to have worked. I grew up actually in California, in Southern California, mostly the San Diego area, but my family always took us hiking and our vacations encompassed camping. Uh, probably because that's what my parents could afford. But at any rate, uh, we were out in nature all the time. And as a teenager, I spent years um, combing the beach and picking up things there. So I really have always had a natural affinity to nature and being out in nature and parks and the wild and things like that. Um, but one thing that has always captured my interest is the minutia of nature. Um, so, you know, I, I like things that a lot of people would just maybe step on or step over and not notice. Um, you know, just a leaf on the path or a little bit of kelp on the beach, um, bits of bark, lichen. Those are things that I just really find interesting. I like the textures, I like the colors. And again, as I said, it's things that a lot of people just overlook. And I kind of like to make it um, noticeable through my artwork. So early on, um, I was working, this is a series, actually these are drawings that I did uh, of bits of seaweed that I picked up on the coast. Even after I moved to Ohio, I always went back to San Diego, you know, two, three, four times a year because my family was there. So I started just again noticing these little things and these are, you know, things that the tide would wash up and again people just step over they don't notice but if you really look at it. Um, and as artists, you know this, you know, you find colors and shapes and all kinds of interesting things. So that's what these are and they were done. Oh, I'm going to say maybe 20 25 years ago. And it's all colored pencil on handmade paper. So as uh, Robbie said, I went to um, Scripps College, which is uh, east of Los Angeles for my undergraduate. And then I went to San Diego State for a master's and then on to Claremont Graduate University for a master's of fine arts. So I've had training in most of the traditional medias, you know, drawing, painting. I did a lot of printmaking, but I've always had an affinity for fiber. It just, and I think that comes a lot from my childhood. My mother uh, sewed all the time. 
my grandmother would knit and there were always scraps of fabric around and pieces of yarn and I would play with those and just really loved the, the way you could manipulate them and that love has never lost uh, left me so these are early pieces I did um, again looking at minutia but I like rocks you know it's not just leaves or bark but I love rocks and I like the way they feel in your hand when you pick them up. I like the way they sound when you kind of clack them together. But something that's really cool about rocks, if you think about it, they've been in the same place forever. You know, what if they could tell us a story? So this is, these are handmade books. It's all paper. The, the rock itself is cast paper. And the premise was if you could open up a rock and it could spill out its memories, what would that be? So these were early pieces, but they do incorporate fiber. Um, the edges are coiled, which is a basketry technique and a uh, lot of use of linen. That's my preferred fiber. Um, then I got on to, well, actually I, when I moved to Ohio, I absolutely fell in love with the hardwood forest because in San Diego, we didn't have trees. We had palm trees, but we didn't have these beautiful hardwood trees or the forests that we have here. And I fell in love with that. And that was just, you know, I spent a lot of time hiking. I still do. Um, and just admiring these trees and how different it was from the environment that I grew up in. And then um, these, this series came out of Hurricane Ike that came through and brought down a lot of the trees in the forest that I typically walk in. I live right by Woodward Park, um, which is very close to Worthington, not too far from Dublin. And to see all these broken pieces around just made me want to do something with them. So I um, decided I'd mend them. And I would sew them back together or I'd use coiling. I'd attach different things to them. I'd make pages or, or leaves out of handmade paper with drawings on them. Um, this one in the corner is called Autumn Skies and I wanted to reproduce the bright, bright yellow birch, um, not birch, beech leaves against that blue autumn sky. So these were quite inspiring for me and they started the whole process of working with tree bark and bits of pieces of trees. Um, and again, this was honoring nature, but it was also meant to make people look and realize the beauty and even these dead things and bits and pieces of nature. From there, I moved on from mending nature to doing a whole funeral series of nature. So again, picking up bits and pieces, and I started weaving these pods. And the pods, they're actually woven on a loom. Everything I do pretty much starts on the loom. Um, it's a 2D process, but I like to engineer it into a three-dimensional piece. So what I do is when I'm weaving on the loom, I've got spacers in there that I pull out when it comes off the loom and then I just grab that warp and I pull it and it makes the whole weaving kind of curl up. And then I would refine it into these pods with the coiling on the outside. But these pods, they were inspired by milkweed pods originally, but then they became for me wombs for nature or shrouds for nature. So this is kind of the dichotomy of birth and death. And uh, again, picking up natural materials. These, um, these pieces right here that look like fins from a fish are actually from a palm tree in San Diego. So wherever I travel, and I travel a lot, I'm picking up things, I'm bringing it back, I'm trying to figure out how I can use it in my work. It makes the security at the airport a little bit crazy, but <laughs> that's neither here nor there. Um, as I said, I travel a lot. Um, this is my studio, the, the top two portions. And here I've got lots of, you see, I pick up tons of stuff. I've got shelves full of stuff. But I have a fairly large studio. I've got quite a few looms and 
place to make paper and all of that. And it's wonderful. But I was um, given the opportunity to do a residency in Florence, Italy. And this came about because when I was working at CCAD, uh, I was in charge of all the international education. So I would go abroad and I'd set up programming and recruit students to go and got to make some really amazing um, contacts. And one school that I worked with invited me to res residency. And in fact, when I did my residency, Helen, who is on here and my colleague, was teaching there. So we got to be together there and that was fun. And the reason I wanna tell you about this is, you see all these pictures in my studio. Here's my studio in Italy. All I had was half of my dining room table. It didn't have any looms, didn't have paper making supplies. I had brought some spools of thread with me and a few pieces of tiny handmade paper pieces of, shaped as leaves and my colored pencils. And it sounds pretty stark, but it profoundly changed my work because I had to innovate. I had to figure out what can I do with these, you know, the bare minimum and working on the streets of Florence. So I began by looking at the tabernacles, which are really ubiquitous in Italy. They're on every corner and they're pretty much shrines to Christianity. And I thought, well, what if I were doing this? What would it be? I would put nature into a shrine and I would honor nature. So I started finding little niches and things in Florence, both uh, Florence and Rome actually, and making these little sculptures that could go in them. And um, because Helen was there and she's a photographer, she helped me photograph them. And she, Helen, I'm gonna embarrass you here. She encouraged me to place sculptures in niches and just walk away and leave them. And that was really hard to do but it was great because it really frees you up and it made me think about the preciousness of it, but also leaving it there for somebody else to find. Um, so these are results of that. Uh, I did, oh, I can't even tell you how many, but there were a lot of them. And I did those over, not only on my residency, but over the next couple of years, I would go back and place sculptures and leave them and do the photographs. So all I have are the, um, these are actually the photographs of those pieces printed on handmade paper. And these are the actual sculptures right here, some of them that I placed. These are more, I really, really got into this idea. And the next residency I did was in New York. And I wanted to continue on with these niches and the idea of honoring nature in this way, but I was no longer in a place where they were. So, but I did have a lot of photographs. So I started printing them and then sewing nature into them. So these are actually leaves that are in here. They're real leaves that I sewed into the photograph on handmade paper. Um, and because I was working in New York, I wanted to do something that had to do with Manhattan. So I found a book of old maps and I started cutting them up and I would incorporate them into here. So I was literally stitching nature back into the city. And there's bits of bark in here. There's bits of um, wasp nests. But at the same time, I started weaving these pods. You know, I have always woven the pods, but now the pods themselves became the tabernacle or the shrine with something in it. So I did it, started a series of these and I have continued doing that to this day. I've made hundreds of these things. And again, they're woven on a loom, uh, forced into a three-dimensional shape and then refined with the coiling. And then either you know, these have maps inside of them with leaves and uh, actually some encaustic in here. 
Okay, these are examples of a lot of sculptures that I started doing and here again I was sewing the pod right into a piece of bark or uh, finding little twigs that it would fit in and sewing seeds into them. Um, just a whole series of these. These are very tiny. You can hold them in your hand and I like that idea. In fact, I called them handheld sculptures. Uh, again, I'm using linen a lot, but in many of the work, um, the bottom one with the white pods, that's paper, spun woven paper. It's called shifu, which is a Japanese technique. So you take handmade paper, you cut it into little strips, you spin it. I spin it either on a wheel or with a drop spindle, spindle and then you weave it. And, oh, the computer's giving me all kinds of trouble here. And it's very, very strong. As I said, it's a traditional Japanese technique that uh, they made kimonos out of. And it's washable. It's amazing stuff. So I started looking at old growth forests there. And as I said, I travel a lot. Um, Helen and I have traveled a lot together. And this is a series that came out of a trip that we took to Sedona. And I loved the red rocks and the, the wood that I could find there and the sandstone. And then the lacy areas are actually pieces of cacti. And I call it cactus skeletons because Helen turned me on to this. You can pick up a dead piece of cactus and you strip away all the fleshy stuff and you've got this filigree, which is absolutely beautiful. So I wanted to create these pieces that really talked about the redstone and the mountains there and that connection to indigenous people. Uh, so this is a series that came out of that. And one of my favorites, actually, I still really, really like this. More from travels. Um, this is to the Pacific Northwest and love the old growth forest, the wood that could find there, but I also fell in love with um, the beaches and the driftwood that would come there and picked up, we weren't supposed to, but we picked up a lot of driftwood, little pieces, stuffed them in our backpack and spirited it away. And the reason I liked those is because we came from the old growth forest, which, you know, huge, beautiful trees. And here on the coast were these pieces of driftwood that reminded me of bones of the forest. So this series is called Bones of the Forest. The ones on the bottom, um, I incorporated some rusty pieces in that I'd picked up on the beach and liked a lot. And I contrasted that with the weaving and seed pods. Um, the one with the blue, the stick kind of thing. That was just kind of a fun little thing. You know, it was just whimsical, um, but I liked the wood a lot. Okay, living in Ohio, as you know, the Emerald Ash Borer has come through and just devastated our trees. And I wanted to do something with that. Um, so I started creating these little sculptures where I would take the bark from the ash tree, which if you've ever seen it, uh, once the tree dies, well, actually before the tree dies, the bark just kind of sheds off in beautiful big pieces. And so I wanted to recreate that tree with handmade paper. So I created discs, almost like shelf mold. And, you know, these were the maquettes, the first ones that I did. And then these came about. I started collecting um, big sheets. And these are probably, oh, the largest is probably eight feet. And there's now probably, I keep making them. So there's about 30 or 40 of them now. And I had these at the Rife Gallery and they kind of filled the whole window area. But again, trying to recreate that dead tree with handmade paper. 
This piece down here was same idea, only this uh, bark came about from a derecho that came through and again devastated the forest that I walk in. So I picked up pieces, wanted to put it all back together, again, making paper that would complete it. There's something poetic about completing a tree with paper because our commercial paper is made from trees, but I'm putting it back. Um, I don't make my paper from wood pulp. It's all natural abaca, which is a banana fiber. Uh, very strong, can do all kinds of beautiful things with it. And again, I always incorporate fiber in some way, whether I'm stitching it or coiling or what have you. It's that combination of paper and fiber that I really, really like. So um, this is the, the trees are called ghost forests because they really remind me of the ghosts of the, of the trees. This is a series I did called The Naked Truth. And again, it addresses the um, emerald ash borer. Um, the pods contain a bit of the bark and then it's mounted on bark. And I often try to recreate the color of that beetle because the emerald ash borer is actually a beautiful little insect. It's bright, shiny green and it has red on it. And it's very cool. Um, but I, again, wanted to honor those trees and talk about the destruction of them. Um, I'm sorry about that. I'm fighting a cat in my lap here. <laughs> um, so, you know, the emerald ash borer most likely came to this country in crates from China uh, for commercial goods that we don't really need. So it's really our own greed that caused this to happen. And I like talking about that in my work. Here's a piece that again, mending a tree. Uh, funny story with this one. This is about 10 feet in width. And my brother's a sculptor too. And he works a lot with natural materials. He started as a woodworker, but I had visited him in his studio in Floyd, Virginia. And he had this piece of bark that he had all flattened out. It was beautiful, it was huge. And um, he didn't want it anymore. So I said, hey, I'll take that home. So he went to load it in my car for me and it wouldn't fit. So he took his saw and he cut it into pieces. And I said, no problem, when I get home, I'll weave it back together. And that's exactly what I did. I did the weaving that connects the, the bark to itself. And the weft in this is um, twigs. Uh, the warp is linen. I almost always use linen, but I put it back together and it became a piece that I really like. In fact, it's hanging at Smith Hardware. Um, okay, the next one. These are also pieces of bark that I wanted to complete with weaving. I like that the flat ones, I decided, well, let's do some that are really um, weaving the shape of the tree. So completing that trunk. So again, this is twigs as the weft and um, linen as the warp. So you're looking at it sideways. It's really woven the other way. For anybody who knows anything, Kathy, you know all about weaving. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but um, I like the idea of recreating something that's been lost to us. These pieces, I work in two different ways. I'll have an idea and I'll go out and find a piece of wood or a piece of nature of some type that fits that idea. Or I will find a wonderful piece of wood and think, what can I do with that? And I'll bring it back to my studio, contemplate it for a while and figure it out. Um, so I both, I'm always collecting stuff, but I'm always look, going out looking for specific things that will work for what I want. So both of these, um, the top one was that wonderful piece of wood I found. And it's like, what can I do with this? The bottom one is I have these pods with these leaves stitched in. Let's find a piece of wo wood that it will fit with. And I actually, that bottom one, I pulled that piece of bark out of my wood pile. So I get it everywhere. Um, these pieces, um, 
I'm represented by Muse Gallery and, and they, they're here in Columbus, but there's also a Muse Gallery in Hilton Head. And I did a show there, it was a group show. But while I was there, I did a lot of hiking and I got just really interested in what I could find there. Uh, the two white pieces uh, came about in a hike I did actually with my brother. Um, my brother's a scientist and he's a smart aleck and he's older than me and he likes to tease me. And we were hiking and we found um, the remains of an egret, uh, mostly just feathers. Obviously something had uh, killed it and eaten it. And these feathers are lying around and, and Rick goes, well, you can just make yourself a hat. And I thought, hmm. <laughs> so I started researching hats and egret feathers. And it turns out that the egrets were almost extinct because of women's hats. Everybody wanted feathers on their hats. And two women, they were society women, and they decided they were going to start boycotting hats to save the egrets. And they did indeed save the egrets. And along the way, they established the Audubon Society. So these two pieces, um, the first one is called Hats Off to Egrets, and the second one is called I Am Not a Hat. The third one is Spanish Moss. Um, most of us have seen Spanish Moss, you know, just hanging out of the trees, whether it's for real or in a photograph or what have you. But again, in researching it, Spanish Moss is really pretty interesting because it's an import to this country. It comes from South America, and most people think that it's a parasite, but it actually is not. It lives in the trees, but separate from the trees. In fact, it doesn't put down any roots. It doesn't take nutrition from the trees. It's, um, it actually enriches that tree by bringing uh, insects to it and birds and helping um, to insulate it from the heat. And uh, I, I really thought of it, at the time there was a big to-do about immigration in this country and trying to stop that. And I embrace immigration, you know, the, the diversity of people and cultures, it just enriches all of us. And that's what the Spanish moss is doing. So this piece is called Huddled Masses, and it's all about immigration. And they are woven pods in there. I wove the Spanish moss right into it, which was a feat in and of itself. And then um, up inside of those pods are all different colors that come spilling out, which really represent all the cultures that we are bringing together. Uh, the final piece here is called Hang Ten in the Gyre. And this refers to the plastic um, island floating in the Pacific Ocean, which is called the gyre. And, you know, having grown up it, on the Pacific Ocean, you know, it's near and dear to me. And it just kills me that there's all this plastic. So I wanted to create my pods almost like um, waves in the ocean. And then underneath are all these melted plastic bottles. So that's a comment on the environment as well. Um, this piece is called Colony Collapse, and it is juxtaposing the um, collapse of the bees with urban decay. And quite a few little pods all sewn together, but in each one is a photograph. Um, the photographs were taken up in Cleveland. Uh, again, Helen and I were up there and uh, we wanted to get really interesting photos. So we went out early in the morning and to some of the industrial areas, some creepy places, and took photographs. And I, I uh, mounted, I printed them on handmade paper and then they're coated with wax. Um, again, I like the, the juxtaposition of the wax and the beehive. Uh, this is a larger piece. Um, so it's probably about 45 inches across the stick. Um, and I was getting a little bit more political at this point. So this one fit right in. 
uh, at this time, Karen Peterson, who is my gallerist, opened a new gallery called Not Sheep. And it was in the short north. She had it for three years. That was the plan, always three years. But it was to show work that was environmental, political, feminist, work that other people would not show. Uh, so I started doing things that kind of fit in there. And this came of that. Um, then, next, we went to the Amazon rainforest. A group of us took a trip to Ecuador, and it was amazing. And the show that we've been talking about, Tipping Point, is a result of this trip. And all I saw there and felt there and you know, I've always had this idea of the Amazon as being this wealth of knowledge. And it is, you know, there's so many plants there. Uh, in fact, I'm going to read you a few statistics there. It's home to 40,000 plant species, 1,300 bird species, 3,000 types of fish, 2.5 million different insects, and 430 species of mammals. I mean, it's the biodiversity is just amazing. It's something we really, really need to protect. Um, so, created again. Uh, let me show you. This is the spirit tree. It's a kapok tree. Again, absolutely huge and inspiring. And this gentleman is the shaman of the Kothan indigenous people that we met and worked with when we were there. And uh, he would come to this tree. He was the eldest of his tribe. That's why he was a shaman. And he'd come to seek answers. So it's very spiritual. It's very important. And I wanted to do something with that. So Helen and I started working together. And we were talking about the Amazon. And we came up this, with this idea that it's, it's there's... Um, tatters and fraying the fabric of the Amazon and how could we represent that. So uh, we gathered together a lot of uh, pieces of handmade paper, um, bits of fiber, banana fiber, some of the uh, cacti skeletons that we had um, and started stitching things together. Here's some of the pieces. And you can see these, these are in the show at the Cultural Arts Center. Um, Helen took the photographs of these children and adults of the indigenous people, and we sewed them into the paper. And we did, I think there's 30 of these that all um, are put together into this big quilt. Um, and this was something that we did during the pandemic. And I like to talk about this because it kind of saved us uh, we would get together in my backyard at this big long table and one of us at each end, not close together, and we just sew and sew and sew. And it was so cathartic and it was just, it was a healing thing for us, as well as us talking about healing the Amazon. So that was an amazing experience. Some other experiences that were there. Um, and things that we saw. This is a bird that lives there. It's called an orum pen pendula, orum pendula, or a weaver bird. And it is amazing. Listen to the sound. You would hear this throughout the, the rainforest. And it's like, what is that? That's amazing. But they make these nests. They're woven out of twigs and they usually have them in colonies of maybe 25 to 100 of them hanging out of the trees. And the bird puts one egg in each of these nests. It's very strong. Uh, and I was just taken away with it. I mean, being a weaver, it's like, wow, this is really cool. And I wanted to do something with it. So this is the first sculpture I did addressing the weaver bird. And again, it's linen, it's hanging off a branch. And it's very solid, it's very strong, um, all coiled. 
but the bottom has these tears in it where this color is coming out of. And those are the colors that the indigenous people typically wear. Um, but the whole idea was that the, the indigenous people live in harmony with the rainforest and have for thousands of years. And they depend on it for everything, food and shelter and medicine. Um, but as we as land is grabbed or stolen from it, we lose those stewards of the land. And with that, we lose the knowledge that they could be passing down to us. So we're robbing ourselves, basically, of medicine and, cure, and cures and the spiritualism, not to mention the beauty of that place. So with those in mind, I wanted to use that weaver bird as a metaphor for this. Um, so, you know, a strong nest, but it's, it's, the fabric of it is ripped and it's leaking. Next, I decide, well, let's make some real weaver bird nests. So this piece is actually at the Cultural Arts Center now, but this photograph was taken at Ohio Dominican where we did a show. And here I made these nests out of a material called Kozo, which is a plant fiber. It's related to the mulberry. Um, and it's usually used for paper making. But once you cook that plant, if you're gonna make paper, you would beat it into pulp and make your sheet of paper. But if you take the plant or the leaf and just start very gently pulling it apart, you get this lacy um, fabric that you can just mold onto something and it dries that way. It's very strong. Uh, the top part is all knitted. So I had to relearn how to knit. Um, but they're very fragile and they have holes in them. So they're not, they're no longer supporting the rainforest or those eggs that should be there. Um, next, I started working with this plant. This is called a tagua. Tagua, it's a nut that grows in a particular uh, palm tree in the Amazon. And it's also called vegetable ivory because it looks like ivory. You can carve it like ivory, you can etch into it. Um, so it can really replace ivory. It's sustainable and it's a great thing and they're beautiful. Um, these sculptures, these are tagua nuts on the base of these sculptures. So I wanted again to, you know, really talk about that sustainable material and what it was and how we could really, you know, do something better than using ivory. So again, you'll see the pods appearing in my work. Uh, they're woven. Um, in this case, um, this one is woven from banana fibers uh, because I wanted to speak about the materials I could find in the Amazon. And again, that kozo fiber that makes the lace and lots of coiling with linen. Here's another one addressing the um, tagua seed. And they, they grow in these pods like this and you break it open and the, the seeds are in there. So I was trying to duplicate that. This is called pegged. And the, the title, um, well, the piece itself refers to the delicacy of the environment and the titles derived from the actual pegs that are holding those woven pod shapes to the branches. And again, that's a metaphor for the precarious position of the environment. And all of these pieces you can see in the show. So I hope you all get to go. Um, this piece is called Once There Were Trees. And it's, you know, kind of sad, but the leaves are specimens of what we have lost. The outer part of that leaf is ceramic. It's a delicate yet surprisingly strong material while the inside pods are spun woven paper. Each one holds a ginger seed and ginger is a medicinal herb used to treat and relieve illnesses. And in this case, the deteriorating environment. And there's a whole wall of these, probably about 50 of them. This is my Gaia's Womb series, and I wanted to really talk about Mother Nature here. Um, so I wanted to do these forms that reminded me of wombs. 
and what's growing in them. They each have a bit of nature, a leaf or um, some kind of bark, or in case of the one on the uh, right, it's a pomegranate. No, I'm sorry, not pomegranate. It's a lotus seed. I don't know where I got pomegranate. I'm looking at the color. <clears throat> These are not in the show. These are, are different. Um, during the pandemic, you know, there's so many horrible things happening. You know, there's climate crisis, there's political strife, there's social issues going on, not to mention COVID. So I wanted to do something a little bit more uplifting. So I started making these. Um, this one is called Seeds of Hope. And it has milkweed seeds or pods in it with the seeds attached. This one is called Novena because it's got nine prayers to the universe, each with a um, dried up rose in it. And this one, this was just a fun one I did talking about how when you go out and collect things and put them in your pockets, you know, when you're a little kid, you're always picking up stones and seeds and rubber bands and you put them in your pocket and then your mom throws them in the washing machine and then she yells at you because you had the stuff in your pocket. Well, I still do that. Um, I always have stuff in my pocket. So this is titled, check your pockets before you launder. And then this one is just titled hope. Again, a little bit of fun, more uplifting. Uh, then I went back to the idea of Gaia and uh, these are Gaia's warriors, and they were meant to be symbols of a strong feminine nature that would go to war for the environment. So they are pods that I always make with a um, milkweed pod inside. And, you know, these are um, really kind of, if you look at them, they really do evoke feminism. And I did a series of these and they all kind of march around together. The other one is called Gaia's Scepter. And that was just a fun piece I did. This little thing inside of it, I used to have a tradition on, um, we celebrate Yule or um, the solstice. And one of the things we always do are take mandarin oranges and just completely coat that orange with cloves. And it smells so divine. And then it dries up into this beautiful little thing. So that's what that is. Okay, so what's next for me? Um, I am working now with um, fungi. I really, really like fungi. And I go out, I walk in the woods almost every day. And, you know, really noticing these things, but also reading a lot of things about the mycorrhizal network. You know, if you've read The Mother Tree, Finding the Mother Tree, or any of those books, it's just, it's amazing what's going on underground. So I want to do some sculptures that do that. So that's what um, is going on here. But I'm also collaborating with Molly Jo Burke, who is a glass artist, and she is providing me with pieces of glass that I'm embedding into my pods. And at first I thought I'd take these to the forest and photograph them there. But now I'm thinking I need to take a trip to San Diego and put these in the tide pools and photograph them there because they remind me of sea creatures. Um, so that's where I am now. I typically, when I work, I work on about anywhere from five to eight or nine sculptures at a time. So I always have a lot of things going on. I'll never be bored. Um, and I'll never be organized. because uh, It's just always going on because I get ideas faster than I can complete them. And I just keep moving on to more things. And sometimes I have to just take a step back and say, hey, I need to finish these three things, get them done. So as we already talked about, Tipping Point is opening tomorrow. Um, Helen and I have been installing for the last couple of days. It's done, it's ready to go. And I certainly hope that you can go and see it. Uh, we're really pleased with the show itself. And as I said, it's an important message that we're trying to get out there about the environment. So now, you know, questions? I have a question. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Robbie. 
No, it's good. Oh, um, Char, uh, how do you do? How do you transfer your images to handmade paper and to some of these other surfaces? Well, um, I do. I have a printer that does it, an Epson printer that I just a put flat, my handmade paper a flat in. Bed. No, oh. no, it's just a regular printer. It's a, a uh, inkjet printer. I'm trying to stop sharing my screen here. Um, Helen, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you if you're still here to talk about how you transfer images because you've taught me a whole lot about that. Um, I also print on on digital using a digital printer. So we do that, and then there are other ways to do it too. That um, with alcohol and Purell, so you can transfer that way too. I would love to know that method if you teach it at all or or I'll put it in the chat I'll put it in the chat uh, uh, so uh, there's a link to DAS art and D-A-S-S -S, and I'll put that in the chat thank you do you have to have a specific kind of a printer though well mine is a photographic printer and it's you know it's not a high-end one but it it is made for photography and um, as I said it's an Epson um, I also, when I print really large, like some of those pieces that were done with the niches in Italy, I have a very good friend in Floyd, Virginia, who has, she's a photographer too, but she has a really amazing printer and she will help me print and make the paper that large. Um, because I'm not a photographer, um, but I get help, <laughs> but my little printer works great. And huh. I've even printed it on my just my desktop. It, you can feed handmade paper in there, and it works. Huh? I'm I'm afraid to wreck my 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 printer doing that. Well, I will say that I have ruined a few printers uh, because sometimes <laughs> the paper has little petals in it, or you know, sawdust or something. But typically, it works. And I I make my paper in shapes. You know, it's not just a rectangular paper. My leaves are leaf shaped and, and I, what I do is I carefully tape it to a piece of, you know, regular paper and put it through the printer that way. And I've just had great luck doing that. Because it, the effect is amazing. And those are so beautiful, how all the different things are put together and they're sewn and then you have uh, found items. Those are just beautiful. I can't wait to see them. Thanks. Well, sure. Uh, hi. Hi. Hi, Helen. Hi, everybody. That one piece, the one that was, um, I think it was Gaia, and it was like warriors, and it was a group yes. of pieces. Now, how was that? It looked like they were little, like they were pieces of twigs that were yes. standing up from the table or are they are, yes. are they connected to the wall or how are they no, supporting them? No, they're standing and those twigs are their legs. So is it on a little platform? Nope, they're freestanding. They're freestanding. Yeah, each, each pod has maybe either three or four twigs sewn to it as legs. Okay, that's yeah. beautiful. Thank you. Beautiful. And have you put any prices on any of your pieces anywhere? Yep, they're they're all priced. They're all, but you'd have to uh, message me or email me. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. Char, what sort of adhesives do you use to put to adhere that, like your paper, to a stick or a well, you know, I sew things. I mostly sew things together. Even the thick bark, I'll drill holes and I'll sew those pods in or I'll sew the pieces of paper. Um, I try to not use glue, um, but occasionally I have to. And I use the commercial grade hot glue for sculptures. If, I'm, uh, if it's a flat piece and I'm gluing together, then I'll use a bookbinder's glue. Um, which is, you know, pH balanced and just works really, really well. 
that I like to sew things. <laughs> <laughs> they stay together. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I have to admit, sometimes I have to go back and re-sew things because it didn't stay together, but yeah, mostly it does. <laughs> Hi, Sean. Hi, good to see you. Good to see you again, and I'm, I'm really happy and I'm really fascinated seeing all your artwork. And Thank you. I would like to ask you, do you use any medium or any coating to protect your artwork or do you like put any layer a, over the wood? On the wood, yeah, that's a really good question. When I gather the wood, I have to treat it because first of all, I have to make sure that you're not transporting insects, especially the emerald ash borer. So if it's small enough, I'll freeze it. I have a big commercial freezer and I'll put it in there for a couple weeks, uh, but I clean it all off. I, you know, brush it and scrape it and wash it. And if I have to, I'll use an organic insecticide, but I rarely do that. Um, but then I coat it and I coat it with an acrylic medium. And I use Mod Podge a lot. I thin it down and I use that and it just seals the wood really nicely and you can't tell it's there. So yeah, it's important to do that. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed all your work. Thank all you. the best for tomorrow's show. Thanks. Char, I was wondering when you went to uh, Florence, that was uh, probably several years ago, you said, and you left all these little sculptures around for people to find, which I found amazing and very special. I, I can just imagine these people finding this artwork and wondering what they are, who made it, how, why is it there? Did you leave a note or your name or some information? You know, I, I often thought about doing that, but I did not. Uh, I just wanted to keep people guessing. You know, at some point I thought, well, I could put a QR code on it, but I didn't. Um, and I have no idea what's become of these things, you know, I just don't know. Uh, and that's kind of the fun for me. It's a mystery, but I like that idea of surprise that somebody would happen upon it and think, what is this? And, you know, since then, um, whenever I do a residency, I will leave a sculpture behind um, in the mm. woods or somewhere. So I try to do that. It's just kind of giving back. Um, so there, there are pieces around. <laughs> and in fact, in Dublin, I've got a few pieces. Um, I've got one down in the, I don't even know the name of the park, but it's right off of 161. There's a sculpture in a tree there. And uh, I left some at the Springfield Museum of Art in their garden out front. <laughs> so they're all, all over the place and I, I'm doing more of that. I just, that interests me. Sounds wonderful. Some of the metro parks now have um, kind of wild areas where kids don't necessarily have to stay on a path. And as I've visited with my grandsons over the last few years, kids have made sculptures with wood. Yes. And they're, they're, have you seen those? They're, I have. They're fascinating. And I know. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's really a cool thing. I love it. Yeah. Shar, I don't know if you've um, talked about this or not, but what brought you to Columbus from where you were? And, you know, how long have you been in Columbus? And, you know, well, yeah. I've been here for 40 years. So pretty soon I have to say I'm from Ohio. Um, <laughs> But I came from San Diego to Columbus and I came for the weather. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, we didn't have weather in San Diego. Uh, my husband is a professor of art or was at Columbus College of Art and Design. He was hired to teach there. And that's what brought us here. We were going to come for three years tops and then move on to New York or go back to Los Angeles. Um, but it was a great place to raise our children and uh, cost of living is great here. And we just liked it and stayed. 
and this is where we'll probably retire. Well, actually, we're both retired from the college, but <laughs> we'll stay here. Well, um, we're so glad you're here. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Any other questions? Well, Charles, thank you very much. It was a wonderful presentation, very inspiring. Really appreciate you doing this for us. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank you for inviting me. It was really fun. So it was great. Thank you so much.